If you want to catch more fish, the skill that you have to master is presenting your flies in as natural a way as possible. If your flies don't act like the real thing, the fish aren't going to eat them. And here's the thing. There's more to a good presentation than just getting a drag-free drift. There's a whole bunch of skills and techniques that you can employ to make your flies look as tempting as possible. On today's show, I'll walk you through six tips to improve your presentation and immediately start putting more fish in the net. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Co. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. The single most important skill that you can develop as an angler, if you want to catch more fish, is to get your flies in front of a fish in a way that looks as natural and realistic as possible. I've been talking about this a lot on the show lately. You might even accuse me of having been on a soapbox, and that's probably correct. <laughs> this has become one of my my passion projects, I, I guess would be a good way to say it, where I really want to help beginners understand that that's what matters more than anything else, is your casting could be picture perfect. It could, it could be award-winning. People could be tripping over themselves to come like your casting videos on Instagram because they're so good. But that doesn't matter if those casts aren't landing in a place where your flies are going to look natural to the fish. And when I say look natural, I don't mean that your flies have to perfectly imitate every aquatic insect. You don't need to tie or buy these hyper-realistic fly patterns. Uh, We know the impressionistic fly patterns work very well. I mean, a paradigm, for example doesn't really look a lot like a mayfly nymph if you really look at it, but the silhouette and the size, they match, and that's what the fish key in on. So what I mean by the natural presentation is making those flies look and act in a way. When I say look, I probably should say behave. They behave in the water in a way that makes them look just like the real thing. That is what your goal is. That's what you should be aiming for. That skill is the one that matters the absolute most. Now, I've talked about this a lot lately, like I've mentioned, but I haven't really dived into the how. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to dive into the how behind this. And I could. I could just give you the same old spiel that I always do about your presentation. Uh, You should should go for a drag-free drift. That's your goal. Get a drag-free drift, and then you're, you're good. Well, here's the thing. A drag-free drift is the end result of everything else about your presentation working together to create that drag-free drift. That's what happens if everything else in your presentation lines up well. You'll get a good drag-free drift. The flies are going to look natural, and boom, you have instantly increased your chances of catching fish dramatically. That's what happens. But everything that we talk about today, the tips that I'm going to dive into These all build to achieving that drag-free drift. And for those who may not know, we talk about drag-free drifts. All drag is, if you've ever seen a leaf fall in the water in in a river, uh, the leaf falls and then it immediately just gets carried downstream by the current. It's not moving of its own accord. It's just being pushed by the water and there's no wake coming off that leaf. There's no little lines or ripples coming off behind it because it's being moved and pushed by the water. But if that leaf all of a sudden took a 90-degree turn and shot halfway across the river, that's not going to look natural. The fish are going to realize, oh, what's that leaf doing, man? Something happened to that leaf. It, it got possessed. That's going, that's going to tip them off that, oh, this isn't natural. That's what you want your flies or if you're fishing with nymphs, your strike indicator to look like. Just drifting without any drag on it at all. So that, that's what drag is. And again, everything we talk about is going to build up to that drag-free drift, and that's the indication that your flies are doing what they should. If you don't have any drag, and then you follow the rest of these tips, there's six of them that we're going to get into the focus on getting you that best, that best, <laughs> that best presentation possible. I got to be careful about how I say that. Might get in trouble with YouTube or Spotify or whoever else wants to censor us today. But anyways, the first tip for you to focus on is positioning yourself. This is a concept that definitely takes newer anglers some time to learn, but it's definitely worth the hassle of learning it because where you stand in the river is going to directly impact your ability 
to get a good drag-free drift. I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I'm standing in a river and there's a nice sized pocket behind a rock. I want to fish that pocket. Well, the rock is going to have two seams coming off either side of it that meet a few feet below the rock. So those seams are going to be where the fast and the slow water meet. There's going to be seams on either side of the rock, and then they're going to meet a few feet below that rock in the river. I know that those two seams are the most likely places for fish to hang out, plus where those two seams meet a few feet below the rock. That's where the fish are more than likely going to be. So if I position myself so that I'm parallel with that rock or with that pocket, I can fish the stuff that's closest to me just fine without any drag. I can just cast, and I can land my flies in that seam, and I'll be able to get a good drag-free drift. I might have to mend a couple of times to accomplish that, but I'll, I'll get that drift. It won't be an issue. But if I need to reach and hit the far seam that's across the pocket, so the, the, the seam that's furthest away from me, there is some potential to get drag on my flies because then I'm going to have my fly line in three separate currents. And at that point, there's a pretty good chance that the current's going to take your fly line and zip things around and make it look just, just like a mess, which is the opposite of what we want. So instead, the best option, if the river allows for it, is to set up downstream of that pocket and fish upstream, because then I can hit each seam with minimal chances for getting drag and I'm putting my flies in the same current, my flies and my line in the same current lines, it works out a lot better if I can get downstream of it. Now, if I can't get downstream of it, if the, if the water is too deep or it's too fast, or there's no stable place to stand, then at that point, you can always try and high stick across that pocket, which high sticking just means I throw my cast out there and then I lift my fly rod high in the air. And I try to get all the line and leader off the water as possible and just leave either my fly or my indicator if I'm fishing nymphs on the water so that uh, there's almost no chance for drag and that you have just a very, very small amount of tippet and leader, or pardon me, just leader out on the water at that point. So that, that is another option you could use. But again, what you're doing here is you're paying attention to how where you're standing in the river is impacting the presentation that you're able to achieve. That's the key with this concept is you have to think through how your position in the water will impact the length and the quality of your drift. If you can stand in a place where you can get a longer drift and it's going to drift longer with less chance for drag or you can throw men's to get it to drift nice and long and beautiful, that's where you want to stand. That's where you want to set up. And generally speaking, the best way to achieve this is to make sure that wherever you're going to put your flies, whatever type of water that happens to be in, that between you and where your flies are going to go, that the current is moving at the same speed. Now, if it's not, that's when you're going to have to either reposition yourself or mend your fly line so that the fly line doesn't get ahead of the flies and pull them or vice versa, however, however the currents are going. But that is how you have to think through this. Okay, You want the longest drag-free drift you can possibly get through good water. So put yourself in a place where your flies and fly line can be in the same current. That's going to pay huge, huge dividends in you hooking up and catching more fish. I'll give you one more example on this because I know this is, this is something that can be pretty confusing and overwhelming for beginners. I just took one out, a, a beginner out recently, and she kept asking me. I was kind of surprised because she kept asking me, well, where do I stand or where do I stand? And I had already positioned her to stand where I thought was best. But the fact that she was even thinking about that was interesting because it shows, it was a good reminder to me that beginners are, are aware of that. And I, I don't think if you're, if you're a beginner or if you're, you're really new to this sport, I don't think that you're not aware of this concept. You probably, you probably are. But understanding how important it is, that can go a long ways to fixing some presentation problems. So and anyways... One more little example real quick is let's say you're fishing a pool. Uh, A lot of us love to fish pools, and we know that the current in a pool is going to move very fast at the head and the tail of the pool, but in the middle, the current's generally going to slow down, not going to be doing a whole lot of anything at that point. If you position yourself downstream of that pool and you try to make a cast that hits the middle or maybe you saw a fish rise up at the head of the pool, then you're going to get drag almost immediately because when your fly line lands that fast current 
at the tail of the pool is going to be pulling much quicker than the current in the middle of the pool, and that's going to get you almost instant drag. Now, it depends on how big the pool is, but a lot of pools, you'll see that happen. At that point, it might be best, if you can, to get parallel to the pool to hit the tail, the middle, and the head without causing too much drag. So that's just another example. Hopefully, you can visualize that and see what I'm saying. Again, this concept to remember is that you want to position yourself in a way that you can make a cast to land your flies, leader, and fly line in the same current. Now, I generally, in, in my own fishing, I avoid standing upstream and casting downstream. I just, I've never fished that way a whole lot. I'll, I'll do it sometimes. Excuse me. But I, I'd never grew up fishing that way. I, I, I just don't feel comfortable doing it personally. There's nothing wrong with doing it. I think the fish will spook a little bit more if you're casting downstream to them just, just because you're right in their field of vision. When you're behind them, you're in a place where it's harder for them to see you. They, they still can when you're behind them, but it's, it's not as easy for them to see you. I, 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 th- there's a lot more about why I don't like to cast downstream to fish. And I know there's people who feel very, very strongly and differently uh, than I do, especially if you fish soft tackles, then you're, you're going to be uh, casting downstream often. I, I just don't like to do it. And it's not a, it's not a technique I recommend to a lot of beginners because the, the hook sets a little bit differently and fighting the fish is a little bit different when you are hooking up, uh, when you're, when you're doing a downstream drift. So my advice to beginners is focus on just casting upstream or parallel at, at the most. And eventually you can work in the downstream stuff uh, at a later date. And the last thing with this as well is you do want to note how close you can get to a particular piece of water uh, when you're positioning yourself to stand in the river. Because if you get too close, you are going to spook some fish. And the only way to know that for sure is through a lot of trial and error. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're, you're going to spook some fish. Th- that just happens. Th- that goes with the territory. Uh, that's something you'll just have to learn eventually. Personally, I err on the side of caution. I stay as far back as I can. I do a lot of reaching. I do a lot of high sticking uh, just because I like to stand as far back as I can. So I lessen the chances of spooking too many fish. So that's your first tip to think about. Uh, let's move on to the second tip, which is you've got to get your flies to stay in the strike zone for as long as possible, because the longer that your flies are in the strike zone, the higher chance you have of fish eating them. Now, for those who may not know the strike zone, we use this primarily to refer to fishing with nymphs. Uh, but what it is, is it's the place within the water column where the fish are eating most often the strike zone is going to be in the bottom third of the water so from the riverbed about a third of the way up to the surface that's where you want your nymphs to get because the fish are hanging out on the bottom most of the time they might be suspended in the middle of the water column or right below the surface during a hatch but often they're going to be down low they're going to be down deep because the current's slow on the on the bottom of the river and there's a ton of food down there so they can just grab all the all the bugs they want, then they can go lay out on their on their lazy trout recliners, and and their moms can come in and you, you know you're being lazy. You got to go do something with yourself. Oh, shut up, ma! Bring me some meatloaf. <laughs> uh, that's not a personal anecdote at all. Uh, <laughs> but that's where the fish uh, can end up. That's why they like it down there. They can have that kind of lifestyle <laughs> down there. Well, uh, you've got to remember. With this concept, you got to remember that when you're fishing nymphs, your flies don't just immediately sink straight to the bottom in a straight line down from your indicator. Because of the speed of the current, your flies are going to drift downstream before they get into the strike zone because the current is going to push those flies downstream once they hit the water. So based on the water speed and the depth that you're trying to achieve, you need to cast ahead of where you want your flies to drift drift through the strike zone okay so if you're fishing a a river that's moving very quickly and it is pretty deep you're going to cast you might even cast 15 20 feet ahead of where you think the the fish are so that your flies have enough time to get into the strike zone before they get 
to the really good part of the water. Okay. Uh, if you're on a smaller creek and the water's not going as quick, you don't need to cast as far ahead. It depends on how fast the river's moving and how deep you're trying to get those flies uh, to end up. Uh, so that's one way to do it is cast further ahead. Okay. The other way, well, not the other, there's more, uh, but another way to, to make sure your flies are in the strike zone and staying in it for a long time is make sure that you've got enough weight to get your nymphs down to the strike zone. When you're nymphing, uh, you want your bottom fly to be ticking the bottom of the river pretty consistently. You don't want to be hung up every cast. If you're snagging bottom every cast, you're too deep. At that point, you either need to take some weight off or adjust your indicator uh, so that your fly is just bouncing along the bottom. If you're catching bottom every four or five casts or so, you're perfect. That's right where you want to be. And then, obviously, if you drop your flies and you're hooking into fish immediately, then boom, you're in the strike zone. Don't worry about tweaking. <laughs> Don't worry about tweaking the rig at that point because you are set. You're in good shape <laughs> at that point. Um, you can also add tippet. Uh, if you need to get deeper, you can add weight, you can add tippet, uh, and adjust your, your bobber to get deeper as well. All of those adjustments uh, can help you, you get to the right depth and maintain that depth. Finally, uh, the last tip that I'll give you for getting into the strike zone quickly and staying there is something that's called the tuck cast. This is a technique that... Uh, the idea is that you force your nymphs to hit the water first instead of your leader and your fly line. The reason that works and that's advantageous for you is that lets the nymphs cut through the water without anything holding them back. So there's no line to pull on them. There's no, there, there's nothing other than the weight of the nymphs hitting the water. And that's going to increase how quickly they get to the bottom. Because if your leader and line hit the water first, then once your flies hit the water, that leader in line is already moving, and that's going to pull those flies once they enter the water. So they're not going to drop straight down. They're going to keep moving down river instead of dropping straight down. Okay, the tuck cast give, lets those flies drop as straight down as it's possible to. So there's a there's a lot of different ways to perform the tuck cast, and there's a lot of different variations to this that you you can experiment with. Uh, to get your flies to enter at just the right angle. But the, the, the key concept is the same. You want to stop your rod abruptly, so harder than normal. You're going to bring it to a very hard, abrupt stop. So you're already going to an abrupt stop during the cast, but you're going to stop it even harder. It's almost like you want to hammer a nail in instead of just moving the fly rod. You really stop it hard, and then you're going to stop the rod tip higher than you normally do. Okay, it, when you're when you're making your cast, you should be start stopping that rod dip at about 45 degrees in front of you. Well, with the tuck cast, you want to try stopping it at about 30 degrees in front of you instead. The shock of a hard stop with that higher stopping point is going to force the nymphs to hit the water first instead of your leader hitting the water. And that is going to wrap up fly staying in the strike zone. So the tuck cast works. I've used it a few times. Uh, it, it's definitely an effective way to get your flies down to where they need to be. Uh, our next tip, I think this is this tip number three. Yes. Tip number three, uh, is mending. All right. Mending is, I, I've mentioned mending a whole bunch. Uh, knowing how to mend is going to drastically, imp <clears throat> excuse me. It's going to drastically improve your presentation because it allows you to extend a drift without adding any drag to your flies instead of having to recast. So the, your flies are in the water longer. And as we all know, you can't catch fish if your flies are in the air. <laughs> They've got to be in the water if you want to catch fish because that's where the fish are. Mending is simple. All you're doing is lifting and moving fly line. You're not making another cast. That's something I see beginners struggle with. They treat the mend almost like they're throwing another cast, and you're, you're not. You're just picking up and moving fly line. And that needs to be done in a single fluid motion. I see beginners, they'll, they'll make their mends where they, they go to lift their rod up, they stop for a second, and then they, they move their rod to move the fly line. And when you do that, you lose the momentum of the lift, and that causes a hinge, and it makes it tougher, in my experience, to throw a good mend that way. A mend works best, in my experience, by keeping all of your motions fluid 
very similar to how we keep our roll cast nice and fluid. The goal with mending is just to pick up and move the fly line in one single motion and then move the fly line so that it is drifting at the same speed as your flies or your indicators for fishing nymphs so that there's no drag on them at all. So mending is a critical skill. We've actually got a video uh, about mending. We put it together. Uh, I'll throw a link to that in the show notes for you. It's part of our beginner fly fishing masterclass. So definitely go check that out if you need some help with mending. Uh, really simple. Just don't overthink it. And I know that's easier said than done, but, but don't overthink the mending. It is a simple process. All right. Uh, tip number four. This has to deal with your leader length and your size. So your leader length and size matters because especially when we're fishing dry flies, a leader that's too big can actually spook fish because it will cast a shadow in low, clear, slow-moving water. And sometimes the fish can be so picky in those situations that they'll look at that and go, oh, I'm not, oh, I'm not eating that, and scamper. And again, that's not what you want. <laughs> you don't want to spook these fish. The length of your leader matters as well. Because if you need to get a smaller fly to a selectively feeding fish, a long leader lets you get that fly close without your fly line landing too close to the fish. In a fly line, if you, you know, when you watch your cast, your fly line lands with more force than your leader and your tippet. And of course it does because the fly line weighs more, has more mass. So it's going to make a bigger disturbance on the water, right? Yeah. So if you can lengthen your leader to, to give you more room between where your fly line lands and where your fly lands, that's going to increase your ability to be a little stealthy, to, to up your ninja skills, as it, as it were. Uh, a longer leader can be tougher to cast in tight conditions. If you're on a really small river, a long leader can be pretty unmanageable. So I, I don't recommend it for really small, brushy water. Uh, at that point, it's better to just go with a shorter leader, but a smaller diameter. Uh, so maybe bumping down to a five X instead of a four X, for example. Uh, but if you have the room to make a good cast, the only thing you'll notice if you up your leader length at all is that your cast is going to slow down just, just a bit because you're going to have that longer leader. So it needs just a little bit more time to roll out on each casting stroke. All right. Tip number. Oh, sorry. I got ahead of myself. There's a couple other things. Uh, size also matters in the leader and tippet area because a leader that's too thick or tippet that's too thick can actually cause micro drag, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's drag that's so subtle, you almost can't see it, but the fish can because their eyes are better than ours, especially when it comes to looking at stuff on the water because that's where all their food comes from, right? The fish can see stuff on the water just about as well as I can sniff out a really good wing joint, which is honestly the only superpower I have. <laughs> It's the only, that's the only above average thing that I do in my life is find good wing joints. And, you know, dadgummit, I can do that at least. <laughs> but the best way to avoid micro drag is to use tippet that's sized appropriately to the fly. So for example, a size 14 fly needs 4X tippet. A size 16 fly works well with 5X. Uh, the way to know what size of tippet to use with your fly is you're going to divide the fly size by three and then round up. So a 14, if I've got a size 14 fly, and I divide 14 by 3, that's roughly 4. So we're going to go to 4X at that point. If the fish are refusing the fly, and you know that it's perfect, always, 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 always try downsizing your tippet first. Don't switch the fly. Downsize the tippet first. When fish refuse flies, 99% of the time, it's a presentation problem. It is not a fly problem. It is how that fly is being presented. So don't worry about downsizing tippet in that instance. Do it. That's something I highly recommend. And for those who may not know, uh, when we talk about downsizing tippet, if you got 4X on, which is what I fish with almost all the time, unless I have to downsize, 4X is thicker than 5X, which is thicker than 6X. It's just a quick way for us to reference the diameter, the thickness of tippet. So that, that, that's all that those numbers mean. They don't have anything to do with the breaking strength. It's all just to relate to the diameter uh, or the size of the tippet. And uh, a story just to finish this section up here. Uh, I was up on one of my local rivers a couple weeks ago, and water is very low and clear right now. We are 
getting later in the year, throwing some casts out. And the fish were eating dries. Uh, I got there and I could see them munching off tops. I, I was excited. I, I knew things were going to be in good shape <laughs> right when I got there. And I go down and start making a few casts. And the fish are just ignoring everything. They're not looking at what I'm doing. So then I switched down to 5X tippet. And as soon as I switched down to 5X tippet, I caught a fish on the next five casts in a row. Because... That that was the only, I didn't change my fly. I just downsized my tippet and boom, it was on. So it happens, it works. This is a skill that I still use. This isn't just a beginner thing. This is something you're going to use consistently throughout your fly fishing career. All right, and number five, tip number five is fly size. We talked about how important uh, your the size of your tippet and your leader is. Well, your fly size is important as well because of all the things that fish care about when they're deciding whether they're going to eat a fly or not, Size is the most important. That matters more than anything else. Part of your ability to properly present flies lies in your ability to present the right fly. And size matters the most when you're picking things. It's size and then shape. You've got to get those two as good and as close as you possibly can to the real thing if you want fish to come over and eat them. In all my fishing experience and that of every other angler and guide I know, Fish will reject bugs based on size more than any other factor. I, I really wish we could ask the fish why and have a little chat with them. You know, pull up a couch, Mr. Brown Trout. Let's talk for, let's talk for a minute. You know, wh- why does size matter so much to you, you fish? You know, I'll explain that for a second. Sadly, I don't think we're ever going to get that opportunity unless brown trout suddenly make an evolutionary jump and... At that point, I think we'd have other things to worry about. If the brown trout are starting to get that smart, then uh, I, I, I think the fly fishing industry will collapse. <laughs> uh, all, all I know is that size matters that much to these fish. It, it, and you ask any other angler, any other guide who's been doing this for any significant amount of time, they'll tell you the same thing. So we actually have an entire video dedicated to picking the right fly uh, and we use what we call the right fly formula that goes through how to pick a fly based on size, then shape, and then color. I'll link that video in the show notes as well for those who want to take a look at it. Uh, another area here where I see beginners struggle is they'll want to switch flies uh, if they don't get a fish quickly or if the fish rejects their fly. I mentioned this just a few minutes ago, but again, often it is not the fly pattern that's wrong. It's the size. I was out on the water I took my mother-in-law fly fishing recently, and it was the first time she'd ever gone fly fishing. And we got out on the water, and we were fishing a hopper dropper because it was middle of summer. It's perfect time for hopper dropper. And the fish were coming up and looking at her hopper, but they were refusing it. And she fished hard for like an hour with no luck. And finally, I said, okay, I'm going to switch the hopper out. And I put I put like a size 12 on it. It was a size 8, I think, to start. It, no, nah, it wasn't that big. I put a size 14 on it. It was a 10 to start. That's what it was. And within two minutes of switching fly sizes, boom, she had her first fish ever on a fly rod, which is really cool to see. Beautiful brown trout, really big one too, actually. But that's just, I, I, could, I could fill an entire show with examples of it being the fly size that was wrong and me catching fish as soon as I changed. So it really is an important piece of the puzzle, understanding fly size. I I can't stress that one enough. And the last part of your presentation to focus on and to, to, uh, to perfect as best as you can is the concept of working close to far. Uh, What I mean by this is that you, when you're working a piece of water, You want to cast to the water that's closest to you first. You want to work all the stuff that's closest to you first because there might be fish holding in that water. And those fish are probably going to eat your flies if you've got a good drift and you've got a a pretty good fly on there. And if you just cast over that fish that would eat your flies to where you see another fish rising or towards the best part of the hole, chances are you're going to spook the fish that was close to you. And if you spook him, he can run off and spook other fish and it turns into this domino effect where all the fish are spooked and run off, and then you're left not catching anything. So work the water close to far. Work closest to you first. Work your way out to the furthest stuff away from you. 
Don't get impatient and jump to the best water. Work everything and be thorough with it. You can do that. You're going to catch some great fish. Now, I know that was a lot. (laughs) There's always a lot that goes into the presentation side of things. Uh, If there's any way I can help clarify some of those points, or if you want to hear more about a certain topic that I talked about, please reach out and let us know. That's what we're here for. That's what the show's for. Untangled exists to help you have a better day on the water. So if there's anything I can do to explain more of the presentation side of stuff better, please reach out and let me know. But with that, folks, we are wrapping up the first part of the show, but don't go anywhere because we've got the Q&A section coming right up. Anglers are always asking, what bugs are hatching right now? And that's why we put together a year-round hatch chart. It outlines all the major bug hatches so you always know what fly to tie on no matter where you're fishing or what time of the year. So if you want to level up your skills and start catching more fish, click or tap the link in the show notes to get this free hatch chart. All right, back to the show. Every week here on Untangled, we dedicate the last half of the show to directly answering questions from listeners and viewers. Often, these questions can be the basis for the opener of the show, which we just got done with uh, as well. So you never know where I'm going to use your question, but I will use them. So if you've got a question you would like answered about fly fishing, please submit those. There's always a link to do that in the show notes. And opening us up this week is a question from Donnie from Missouri, writes in and says, Hey, I love the show. I've been a spin cast fisherman my whole life uh, after going going after bass, catfish, etc. This summer, I got an opportunity to go up to Calgary, Alberta for an internship. While I'm up here, I started fly fishing and quickly found out that the learning curve from bass fishing to trout fishing is incredibly more difficult than I thought. I've gone out almost every single day after work this past month and have yet to catch a fish and have no clue what I'm doing wrong. I've been to a fly fishing school, ask as many questions as possible to the local fly shops, watch a ton of videos, and listen to podcasts like yours, and I'm still still struggling to land my first fish. So my question is, excuse me, what's a good way to meet other fly fishermen who'd be willing to help me out, and what's the appropriate way to ask to tag along? How do I go about thanking them for taking me, i.e. normally buy gas and beer when someone takes you out on their boat? I would love to get a guide, but unfortunately, I simply don't have enough money to do so right now. Donnie, this is an interesting question. Thanks for taking the time to write in, and thanks for listening to the show. Appreciate it. Uh, I would recommend spending some extra time at the local fly shop and asking around if they know of anyone who's fishing who wouldn't mind extra company. Fly shops usually have a good bead on that sort of thing. Uh, they usually know a few folks who will take people like beginners like you out. Uh, and they might even do it themselves. Some of the fly shop guys might. Really just depends on the shop. Uh, you can also look into half-day guided fishing options too. Uh, those can be, especially if they're walking wade uh, and you're not in a drift boat, those can be a lot cheaper than drift boat fishing and a half-day could be a good way for you to get out and see what you're doing wrong at a more affordable rate than the full day trip. So that's an option. I know you said money's tight. I, I get that. I'm, I'm just trying to give you as many options as possible. So um, as far as asking the fly shop, you, you can really just go in and say, guys, I need help. I need someone to go out with. You know, anybody would be willing to let a beginner tag along so I can ask questions and figure some stuff out. Chances are the fly shop's going to know somebody. Uh, another option is local Facebook groups. Uh, <laughs> the local Facebook fishing groups. I, I see a lot of posts like that in some of the local uh, fishing groups I'm a part of where the guys are asking uh, almost exactly what you said word for word, and they've always got people offering to take them out uh, the best way to ask is just exactly what you said. Hey, I'm new. I want to learn. I need someone to go that I can ask questions of who doesn't mind me tagging along. I'll buy you food or whatever. Um, we've also got here at ventures. Um, we've got a new group that we just launched a, a little group where everybody listens to the show or watch their videos or whatever. You know, you just want to be a part of it. Uh, you can join the group. And I, I've already seen some people in the group talk about uh, meeting up to fish with each other 
So there's there's that as well. I'll put a link to join the group. There's always a link to join that in the show notes as well. So you can check that out. Um, definitely uh, ask or offer to buy the gas, the drinks, and the food. Uh, you don't have to offer to buy all of it, but definitely offer to pitch in. Uh, that's always welcome when someone takes you out. Uh, I'll never turn down the chance to have someone buy me wings. <laughs> so uh, I'll never say no to that. Uh, and it's always appreciated. So always offer. Some folks might say no, but definitely always offer. Um, the last thing you could try, and this might be a crapshoot depending on how friendly your local fishery is. I, I don't know. Uh, I know I, I did this actually quite a bit in Utah growing up. But if you see other people who are having success, they're catching fish, you can always ask them what they're doing and what they're using. You can, you can even ask to watch them for a minute. A, a lot of anglers, a lot, a lot of anglers are a little quiet, not, not as outgoing when we're on the river. But at the same time, a lot of us are more than willing to help somebody out, especially somebody who's new and who is eager about wanting, wanting to learn. And, and when that, when that's authentic, it, it's easy to tell that that's authentic and that's what that person's looking for. Uh, this can be tricky though, because again, not everybody loves to be approached while they're on the water. Uh, but there's there's nothing you're, you're not going to hurt anything by going up. If someone just catches a fish, you could go over and say, "Hey, I've been trying to catch something all night. I can't figure out what to do. Do you, do you mind if I ask what you, you what you were using and how you were fishing it?" Again, if you're sincere in how you ask, anglers, other anglers are going to pick up on that, and chances are you're going to find someone who who's willing to help you out, who's willing to give you a hand. Uh, some people are going to be jerks about it. So that's just how it is. You're going to get that with anything you do in life, but that that's worth it. If you strike out on the other two options. So hopefully that works for you, Donnie. And if there's anything else I can do to help out on that, just please, uh, please don't hesitate to reach back out and let me know. Eric from Colorado has got our next question writes in and says, beginner question here. I was on the water this morning and hooked into a really nice fish. As I was reeling it in, I started having difficulty reeling. It took me a moment to realize why. The knot that joins the fly line to the leader was getting caught up in the top two eyelets of my rod. I couldn't figure out what to do about that, and needless to say, I lost the fish. What do you do when that happens? Eric, thanks for the question. Appreciate that. Uh, I bet 90% of fly anglers use the loop-to-loop connection for joining leaders to fly lines. That's where your leader, almost all the leaders these days come with a pre-tied perfection loop, and then that loop's going to go through the welded loop on your fly line. And it's a strong, simple method, and it usually goes through the guides fine. It's usually small and streamlined and slick enough that it'll go through those guides and not give you undue grief. Sometimes, though, the perfection loop on your leader can be tied poorly. Maybe it's too big, or maybe the tag end on the loop wasn't trimmed enough. Uh, you can simply just retie that loop to get a slimmer knot that'll go through the guides a bit easier if you want. Personally, I don't like the loop to loop connection. Uh, I think it's bulky. It's got a penchant for getting hung up, like you described. Uh, I've just never really liked it too much. I cut the loop off of my fly line and I cut the loop off of my leader. And I like to use a nail knot for a lot of my rigs. Uh, it's a slim, simple way to connect the two. And I haven't had any failures with the knot. I haven't had my whole leader pop off with a nail knot. Uh, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about using the nail knot. If you think, oh, well, maybe I'll lose my rig. Nah, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Just tie the knot correctly. You'll be fine. Now, if you do get the line caught while you're trying to land a fish, just like you did, Eric, the easiest cure I've found is to let a little bit of line off your reel, let the fish take that line, and then you can either try to reel in again or you can just strip line in uh, until you can net the fish. Often, if you take tension off of the fly line just a tiny bit, that knot's going to slide right back out of the guide. But then you run into the issue of if you release tension during the fight, the chances of the hook popping out dramatically increase. So it's kind of a crapshoot, but that's the best way that I've found. I actually asked Alex about this, and he said he's even had the same problem you did with a nail knot. So he he's used the nail knot before, and he'll have the issue where it gets hung up too. Um, he, he said that it's just hard to get anything through when you have the tension of the fish 
that's pulling the line tight and towards the bottom of the guides. What Alex says that he likes to do is to usually keep about a foot of fly line out at the end of his rod, and then he'll lift the he'll lift the rod really high and pull it back, and then he'll stretch really far with the other hand and net it. So you've got to really get your inner gymnast out and stretch it and whatnot, uh, and and that can help. Uh, just keep the line out of the the rod as much as possible so that you don't get caught up in it. That that's one. Uh, one way you could do, and you can also get a net uh, with a longer handle uh, if you fish by yourself a lot and you need some help landing fish, or you could always get a buddy to help you as well. So those are some options, Eric. Hopefully one of those works for you, and thanks so much for sending that question in. Josiah from Minnesota writes in and says, when following the close-to-far approach of finding fish, if a fish jumps or is feeding in a spot that's farther away before I've worked the closer areas, should I cast directly to that fish, even if it risks spooking others, or is it better to stick to the plan and fish closer to spots and fish closer spots first? Thank you for all the content y'all create. I'm learning a lot from your channel and podcast. Uh, Josiah, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And this is a good question. It's very timely too. It fits into the main part of the show this week. Uh, it's an interesting question. And unfortunately, I don't know that I've got a great answer for you. It really just depends on a lot of different factors, and that's probably not what you wanted to hear, but that's the truth for almost everything in fly fishing. I could sit here and tell you, well, it depends on this, or it depends on this, and it really does. It just depends on a lot. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through how I'd handle this, and then you could take from that whatever you want. Hopefully there's something in there that's actually helpful at some point. If I'm If I'm fishing a bigger piece of water, and I see a fish rising, let's say, 60 or 70 feet away. That's a pretty far cast. And if there's a lot of good-looking water between me and the fish that just rose, I'm going to fish that good-looking water before going to that fish that just rose. But I'm definitely going to work my way towards that fish. If I see a fish rise, I'm going to work my way towards casting to it, putting myself in the right position to make a good cast to that fish. If I'm on smaller water, though, Let's say I'm fishing to a piece of water that's 25 feet away from me and a fish rises 40 feet away. I'll probably just cast that fish that rose without worrying about that other 15 feet of good looking water between where I was working and where the fish rose. I do that mainly because I'm too impatient. I think that if I don't ca cast that fish now, it's going to quit rising and I won't have the chance to catch it. That's probably not true. <laughs> Very rarely is that ever going to be true. And it's probably something about my own fly fishing that I should change. I definitely think I need to work on that. And I, I really should focus on fishing that extra 15 feet of water. I shouldn't skip it. That's something I should probably change. But it's also dependent on what water is between me and the fish that rose. If there's a lot of water that looks like it'll hold fish, and I see one already rising further away, then I definitely want to cover that good water first because I, I already see that the fish are active, so I don't want to screw it up by spooking fish between me and the one that just rose. Give you an example of this. There's a river that I love, love, love to fish up in Alaska, and it's one of the most unique rivers on the planet. You get there, and the grayling are rising almost all the time, no, no matter what. The grayling are always up. They're feeding. They're going nuts. And you, I, I get into position. I get where, light, where I like to be to make a good cast. And I know for a fact, because I've fished this river enough, that between me and whatever fish is rising, there's probably t at least 10 other fish is holding and not rising but still actively eating. So I know that if I make a long cast or I wade closer, I'm going to spook those fish that weren't actively rising, and there's a good chance I'm going to put down the one that was rising. All right, I know that because I've fished that river enough, I've made that mistake enough on that river to know that's an issue. But that's going to play out on other rivers as well. That's just an example I like to use. So really it boils down to it. I, I don't do it correctly. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I I just walked it through how I do it, and I don't do it correctly. So I would I would err on the side of not doing what I do. <laughs> Hopefully that'll help. I, I I appreciate that question though, Josiah. Thanks so much for sending it in. Benji from Texas has our next question. Writes in and says, "Hey Spencer, I've been listening to your show for a while, and want to start the transition from a normal to fly fishing. Down here in the South, specifically where I live, trout are basically non-existent." bass and bluegill are on the water and i'm not sure what flies would be smart to fish around where i live what would you recommend also is there a specific size that a creek should be for fly fishing or other fishing i fish mostly ponds and lakes benji good questions uh, i'll tackle your last one first no there is no specific size that a creek should be for fly fishing as long as the creek has fish you can fly fish it now there's going to be some that are a pain in the absolute butt uh if it's really small and brushy and there's very little casting room, or there's a lot of brush or low cover hanging over the water, it could be almost impossible to fly fish. And I hate being in, uh, being in situations like that. But you can fly fish any size river. doesn't matter how big it is, because even on those bigger waters, all you're doing is picking apart, picking apart smaller pieces of a big river when it gets big, and you're just fishing small chunks of it anyways. So there, there is no limit to that. As to your bass and bluegill flies, now, I'm no bass or bluegill expert, certainly won't ever pretend to be, but you should follow the same idea to pick flies for those fish that you would for trout. You want to mimic food sources that are readily available to those fish. I've had a lot of success fishing bluegill, which I'm hopefully everybody's had success fishing bluegill, <laughs> but I, I've had a lot of success fishing bluegill with zebra midges and hare's ears. And basically any beadhead nymph, they're not the pickiest fish out there. With bass, they, they can definitely be more selective. I like to topwater fish for bass. That's my preferred way to chase them. So I have a lot of poppers that I fish near weeds or other structure. I love to do that. I would probably catch more bass if I didn't focus as much on topwater. But I, I love, there, there's few things that are as fun as a big bass blowing up topwater. That's, that's just a blast. I, I love doing that. Um, subsurface, uh, I fish a lot of rabbit leeches and marabou leeches for bass. I think the movement in those two materials does a good job of grabbing their attention, uh, similar to how a lot of bass baits are rigged, uh, for them on conventional bait and spinning rods. So that, that's what I would recommend doing. I know that's not uh, as in depth as you'd like, but at the end of the day, you want to imitate food sources that are available to those fish. So the, the same process that I use for selecting flies for trout, you're, you're going to want to use that same thing for bass and bluegill fishing because they're going to eat stuff that's readily, readily available in the water. So I, I would focus on that process, and I think you'll find out that you'll be fine. So thanks for sending that question in. I appreciate it. And that wraps up the Q&A section for this week, folks. But don't go anywhere because we've got the live real life moment coming right up. Every week during the Live Real Life moment, we feature a story and a picture or video, whatever you want to send in to accompany it, uh, from viewers and listeners of the show who write in to tell us about their time on the water and to share their stories. We love to hear from y'all about your time on the water and see pics and videos of your successes and your time out there living real life. There's a link to submit your Live Real Life moments in the show notes of every show, so you can go find that link there. And this week's Live Real Life moment is from Chris, writes in, and he's got this wonderful picture that we've got up right now if you are watching on YouTube. And if you're listening on audio, I have thrown the picture, excuse me, I've thrown the picture in the show notes so you can take a look at it as well. But Chris writes in and says, hi, Spencer and Alex, I am a brand new fly angler and I watched all of your masterclass videos on YouTube and listened to several podcasts. Your videos were so informative and easy to understand for a beginner. I recently went fishing for the first time and had a blast and even had success. Although I was nervous and anxious being out there for my first time, all your hard work making those videos allowed me such an enjoyable time on the river. I just want to say thank you to you both as I'm totally hooked, pun intended, Spencer, and can't wait to get out again. Side note, Costco is the best place on earth, even if our fly fishing starter kit has no flies. Keep doing what you were doing. Well, Chris, thank you 
so much. I, I appreciate that. I know Alex does. He's not here, but I, I guarantee, guarantee he appreciates it as well. Uh, that's why we do what we do, man. We, we want to, we want to have, we want to be able to help other people have that wonderful time out on the water that me and Alex have had for so many years of our lives. And, uh, th- this is just great to hear that we helped you. So I, I do, I do appreciate that a lot. And just to any other beginners who are listening, anxiety, nerves, your first couple times on the water, that's natural. Chris went through it and I appreciate you being willing to share that Chris, because it's a good reminder to all of us that you're going to get those nerves. <laughs> you're going to get, you're going to be nervous a little bit when you do this for the first time, but you get out there, you get, you get into some fish and, and you'll find that, uh, everything else kind of falls into place. Once you start getting the hang of it, it's a lot less scary than you think. It's definitely overwhelming, but it's a lot less scary or, uh, anxiety ridden than you, than you probably think. So thanks again, Chris, for sending that in. I appreciate it. And with that, folks, we're going to wrap up this week's show. Thank you so much for listening and being here with us. Uh, if you have a question you would like answered on the show, there's always a link to submit those in the show notes. Uh, same goes with your live real life moment as well. We've got a, uh, a link to submit your live real life moments and we need your questions. We need your stories. That's what powers the show. That's why we do what we do here at untangled and at VFC, uh, without your questions, without your help, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be anywhere. <laughs> and speaking of help, if you could please rate and subscribe to the show, wherever you're listening to it, uh, the more ratings and subscriptions we get the more people see our show and the more people we can help get out there and have a wonderful time on the water. And speaking of being on the water, I'm going to, I'm going to quit my yammering now and I want everybody else to get out there, get on the water and until next week, live real life and tight lines, everybody.